you're listening to the Telltale channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk about Lance Walna's bizarre, confusing Christian nationalist conference, the top QAnon interpreter dusting off his keyboard because the leader of the QAnon movement is back, Roger Stone claiming to be a Christian nationalist so he can take advantage of their persecution complex. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send an email instead, the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. A while back, I played this clip from a Trump rally. Actually, I played a couple different clips from a Trump rally that I wanted to talk about where, bizarrely, Trump supporters start talking about gematria, some ancient Hebrew custom of mixing numbers and letters. Let me just show you the clip. Let me show you the clip first, and then I'll explain what's going on here. Listen to this again. This clip is from April 23rd, 2022. It was from a Trump rally at that time. The next clip we're going to hit is from late April also. Let's just watch this one and see what these women had to say at this bizarre Trump rally. Okay, first of all, y'all are so cute. I love the outfits. I would like detailed explanations on every single shirt. Okay, these people are are QAnon members, obviously. I, I mean, it's obvious to anybody who follows the movement pretty closely like I do. But yeah, just listen to how they explain it and you'll catch on pretty quickly. Every single shirt, ready, set, go. Right? So, living, living, and we know living. I believe that's Princess Diana? M- Marilyn Monroe, maybe? I-, I can't really make out who the other people are. One of them is Princess Diana, who famously died in a car accident in the 90s, I think. Rule in the world, and you don't take down evil by being quiet or silent, right? So people need to understand who they are. Do they look like them today? No. You think Princess Diana is still alive? Absolutely, 100%. It was plastered all over every news network from here to Texas for like ever when she died. It was such a tragedy. She was so loved by the people. She was next in line to be queen. And when she died, there was no successor to the line. And it was huge, just terrible thing. Oh, my God. Um, Diana was Prince Charles's wife. Wait, uh, oh, did I mess that up? I'm sorry. Maybe I made a mistake about that. Charles is the heir to the throne, not Diana, and there are others in line. Also, he remarried. The reason it was a big thing is because she was amazing, caring, charitable, mother of the young princes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was, I'm not really a royal family person. I probably should have read up on it a little bit before talking about it. But yeah, thank you for the correction. I'll make sure this makes it to the final clip. They blamed journalists who were following close behind her and they refused to help because they couldn't get involved. It was just a huge mess. Anyway, it was massively publicized when Princess Diana died and pretty obvious to everybody that she actually died. But these people are telling us Princess Diana isn't actually dead. She's ruling the world secretly. Oh my God. They live in a fantasy land. Do you? I didn't, but maybe maybe you have something to that you know that I don't know. No. She does not know anything that you don't know. Certainly not about Princess Diana. Well, you know God speaks to us, right? And there's ways that we can figure these things out. So if people start learning ABC123, which Michael Jackson talked about how many years ago, right? That's Gamatria. She's referring to gematria right there. Just wait. So when people start understanding gematria, they start understanding the numbers. A equals one, B equals two, C equals three. They understand how words work. Yeah. So anyway, she just keeps going and going. I had to cut the clip off somewhere. Like she went off course a long time ago and just kept going. Anyway, that's not the only example of this mention of gematria. We're going to get to why that's important in a second. Just bear with me. This is another clip. This is from the Good Liars, famously. Uh, These people go around to Trump rallies and just ask him simple, basic, straightforward questions, and you get the strangest results. This one came out late April 2022. Listen to this dude. Tell us about it. What is what is negative 48? Because he's got negative 48 on his shirt here, and they don't really know what that is. Well, negative 48 is Michael Brian Protzman. He is teaching gematria. There it is again. It's pronounced gematria, which we'll get to in a minute. Just keep listening. Michael Jackson sang about it. A, B, C, easiest one, two, three. 
And so what, what is Dermetria exactly? A, B, C, one, two, three. A, E, B, and one, and Z, B, and 26. So Michael Jackson, was he part of negative 48? No, but he is, uh... You keep saying is. Is he, is he... He's alive, brother. He's alive. Michael Jackson's alive. Michael Jackson's not dead. Michael Jackson is alive. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, let, let's bring, no, no, let's no, no, bring no. him back, back here for a second. JFK who, who do you is think... not dead. <laughs> really? JFK is not dead, he says. He was resurrected four days later as Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're mixing everything up in their heads. Like, they've heard these conspiracies from, like, the QAnon movement, but they don't even fully understand what they're being told. QAnon didn't claim that JFK was alive. They claimed that JFK Jr. was alive. It was JFK's son who died in a plane crash in, I think, 1994. They're claiming it was a big cover-up by the deep state. He's really alive, and he's going to come back and run with Donald Trump as his vice president or something like that. But he got it all confused in his head. He thinks that QAnon was talking about JFK. He forgets the JFK Jr. part. That's pretty important. JFK would be 105 if he's still alive. <laughs> Quit poking holes. <laughs> Not supposed to poke holes. No, I'm just kidding. We we do need to poke holes, absolutely. It's 4.30 a.m. It's too early for this stupidity. <laughs> Never too early for this stupidity. I find it endlessly entertaining. He's getting everything mixed up, has no idea what he's talking about. None of these people have any idea what they're talking about, especially when it comes to Gamatria, which is exactly what I want to talk about next. Let me show you this really interesting email that I got from somebody recently. A few years ago... I came to New York City to do a documentary style thing with a friend of mine. We were going to go through the Jehovah's Witness headquarters and just film and talk about it. Turned out to be absolutely crazy experience. I uploaded some stuff to my channel about it and Genetically Modified Skeptic uploaded stuff to his channel about it too. But that's neither here nor there. When I got to New York City... We held a meetup here. It was my first time ever being in New York City. It was absolutely amazing. I fell in love with this city. I now live here because I love it so much. It's absolutely incredible. Anyway, when I got here, we held a meetup, a fan meetup. Brought in, I don't know, 80 to 100 people somewhere in there. Hung out with people. It was incredible. There was a guy that I met at one of these meetups who was Jewish and was from the area. He and I just stood there and talked for like, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half about the Jewish religion and how it operates and, and the Jewish culture in New York City and the crazy things that they do, like especially the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox communities, crazy things they do on Sabbath. Like They're so obsessed with not working on the Sabbath that they program the elevators in every single building to stop at every floor on Sundays so that they don't risk upsetting God by working, by hitting a button to go to the correct floor. They can't light a flame on Sunday, so they'll cook all of the food they intend to eat the next day. And they'll put it in the refrigerator and they'll turn their oven on at like 200 degrees and let it run all day on Sunday so they don't have to light a flame because that would be against their religion and they just pop their food into the oven to heat it up and then pull it out and eat it so they're not working quote unquote they're not lighting any flames they can't even drive their car because it's a combustion engine on the Sabbath not Sunday I'm sorry yeah that's what I meant I, I guess different cultures do it differently on different days and stuff so yeah the Sabbath not on Sunday this guy was super interesting with the stuff he was telling me about it, right? Well, he sends me an email the other day, this, this same guy I talked to when I met him in New York City, and he was telling me not only about Gamatria and the crazy stuff that we heard from these people, but he told me about even more stuff past that. So I wanted to read the email and see what kind of insights a Jewish guy could give us about the QAnon movement, because a lot of the stuff that QAnon believes bizarrely somehow routes back to the jewish faith anyway let's read this i cut his name out because i didn't know if he would want me to say it but if you're watching this you want me to mention you let me know i'll put it in the comments 
I mean, I've been talking. I've been corresponding with this guy since we first met years and years ago. So there was no title on it. It says, hi again, Owen. I was catching up on some of your videos. It's been pretty busy on my end. I had some thoughts on some of what you presented. You're talking about Gamatria pronounced with a hard G. Yeah, I was pronouncing it gematria originally in the video a few times over the past weeks which i found really interesting growing up orthodox jewish i'm very familiar with the concepts but the way these cultists are using it is so far from the way it's traditionally used first of all the jewish system is based on the hebrew alphabet which is obviously different from english if you notice the guy in the previous video said abc one two three where a is one and z is 26 I don't know where he got that idea. Gamatria, as the emailer was describing, is based on the Hebrew alphabet, which is completely different from the English alphabet, like in every way. Anyway, which is obviously different from English. There are only 24 letters. And part of the idea is that they believe the script and language was created directly by God. All other languages were created by man after the Tower of Babel. Next, the numbers do not go from 1 to 24 in single increments. Rather, the system is built with the first nine letters corresponding to 1 to 9, the next nine letters corresponding to 10 to 90, in increments of 10, like 10, 20, 30. The remaining letters correspond to 100, 200, 300, 400. Additionally, the new rules allow for the sum to be off by one number because you can add single number credit for the entirety of the word. On occasion, if you're trying to figure out a gematria for a phrase, you can be off by the number of words in the phrase, but that's not generally accepted by many people. I've mostly only heard of people using this as a tool to convey ideas, never predictions. For example, a rabbi I knew would always put together a gematria with the name of bar mitzvah boy on one side of the equation and a phrase relating to good morals or fortune on the other side. It was cute. That's really, really fascinating. I really appreciate that that insight into the Jewish traditions and how it relates to QAnon. That is so interesting. I mean, we knew these QAnon people were completely disconnected from reality, but it's so interesting to kind of get an idea for how these concepts were originally used and how they're being bastardized by the QAnon movement now. But there's more. There's more to this email, interestingly. He continues, You've also been pointing out the people claiming to be prophets. In Judaism, like Christianity, there's the stipulation in the Torah slash Bible that prescribes the death penalty for false prophets. According to modern rabbinic Judaism, there have not been any prophets since the time of the second temple. I don't recall if the beginning or the end. I'm not sure when the time of the second temple was. But let me see if I can just look this up. Judaism is such a fascinating religion honestly and it gives you so much insight into the origins of christianity and how christianity has completely bastardized all of these ideas like bastardized and perverted all of the ideas that it started on all of the foundational ideas okay time of the second temple was 597 bc to 70 a.d so that sounds like basically from the time the book of job was written to the time that the book of Mark was written, the first gospel, pretty much. He said, according to modern rabbinic Judaism, there have not been any prophets since the time of the second temple. So since the book of Job to the book of Mark, roughly. There is a specific system for determining if someone qualifies as a false prophet. The rules are as follows, if memory serves. If someone claims a prophecy that something bad will happen and it, does, and it doesn't come true... That can't be considered false because perhaps the people repented and changed God's calculation such that God tore up the damaging decree. If the prophet says something good will happen and it doesn't, that's considered a false prophet worthy of death because God would never go back on the promise for good even if people started to sin. In this system, I'm really curious if any of these prophecies would count because they obviously see Trump taking office as a good thing, but it's clearly bad. It's a good thing prophecy isn't real and death penalties for false prophets aren't warranted. Otherwise, there may be people waiting in line by the executioner, which is not something I condone. That is really interesting, really interesting insight into the the Jewish faith, basically, and the Jewish position on all of this. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess you say Trump taking office is clearly bad. In our view, it's bad. But in the view of these right-wing extremist Christian nutcases, it's clearly good. 
and we're we're not dealing with people who are tethered to reality here. We're dealing with people who believe that like there's a satanic cabal of like Satan worshiping, baby eating, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So in their minds, if they were following what the prophets say and the fact that the prophets violated the law and lied, obviously falsely prophesied, in their mind, Trump was a good thing. I would say that they would be worthy of the death penalty biblically. That's my read on it, but... uh. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Okay, here's here's this, the third section that he gave us. Talking about death penalties, there are four methods of death prescribed in Jewish law, and they're associated with specific sins slash crimes. I can elaborate on what they are and how they are carried out if you want. It's worth noting that Jewish courts, which absolutely do exist in modern America in Jewish communities, only deal with religious matters and torts, cases that can legally be litigated in front of an arbitrator. Part of this is because there is a religious law requiring the adherence to local laws, assuming they don't explicitly conflict with religious law. Even during the temple times, according to the Talmud, a court was considered a bloodthirsty court if they carried out a death sentence more than one time in 70 years. Wow, really crazy. I hope this was interesting, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. I really appreciate the email. That was absolutely something else to read through. Uh, Our conversation that we had in New York City originally was absolutely fascinating, too. Learned a lot from it. Learned a lot from this email. I really appreciate you sending me these little little tidbits of information about Jewish culture and laws and stuff. Uh, Love it. Love it. So I had heard this conspiracy theory that I've uh, about Al Gore in the presidential election of 2000, that he had attempted uh, to traffic a lot of people from Mexico over the um, over into America and grant them citizenship in exchange for their vote for that presidential election. I've never heard this before. I couldn't find anything about it on the internet. It sounds really crazy. Um, have you ever heard about that before? Uh, yeah, let me know. Thank you. I appreciate the voicemail. That's really interesting. I had not heard that about Al Gore, but I know that Trump made similar claims about Hillary Clinton back in 2016. They were busing people in. Let me tell you why it's ridiculous. Because we have voter rolls. To vote, you need to register to vote. You have to give them your information, your address, social security number, the whole nine yards. You got to give them your ID and sign it and all of that. You can't just ship 10,000 people into the country or just sign ballots off randomly with random names, John Smith and Jeffrey or, or whoever else. Like, you have to have actual real people with real social security numbers who are really legally allowed to vote. That's how the whole voting system works. Yeah, you need voter ID to vote, blah, blah, blah. You need an ID to register in the first place. If you're registered and your signature matches the signature that you put down when you registered and your address matches and everything else your vote is counted it's not as insecure as they want to make it out to be it it really is extremely secure our voting system is it's hard to get one over on the voting system without getting caught i would say the vast majority of people if not every single person who tried to commit fraud in the election which happens every single election it's inevitable in a country of 300 million people every single person i would venture to guess has been caught because it is so hard to lie about this it's so hard to trick people it doesn't surprise me to hear that there are conspiracy theories spreading around about it what surprises me is that it's the exact same conspiracy theory from 2000, as in 2016 and 2020. They keep recycling the same stuff over and over and over again. QAnon, the movement and the belief system, ultimately are just a rehashing of old Nazi ideologies and tropes, really. It's nothing more than that. Hey, what's going on? This is Alex. So one thing I've been curious about, um, what do you think, percentages these days of churches, Christian churches being political, um, you know, preachers and priests and all that talking about the culture wars or just straight blatantly talking about politics on the pulpit. 
to me, you know, being online, it seems like it's a lot these days, but I'm curious if what you think, how rampant it is. Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. It's an interesting question. Roughly how rampant is the extremism, the, the right-wing extremism that you find in the United States? Well, we have a few data points to look at. A while back, I was looking at roughly how rampant QAnon is. When you're dealing with things like this, you have concentric circles because people are different levels of radical and extreme. So the center circle that we've got here, I would say makes up somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 percent of the country okay 10 to 15 percent these are people who deeply believe a lot of the QAnon inspired radical nutcase stuff a smaller circle inside of that would be i'd say maybe five percent of the country and they believe jfk jr is really alive and he's going to run with donald trump in the future he's going to be his vice president and just you know all of the completely unrealistic reality bending conspiracy theories that QAnon believes in. So you got the 5% one, that's the core QAnon audience. 10 to 15% are, are still very radical, believe a lot of the QAnon ideas and ideologies and beliefs, but they don't buy into the most hardcore stuff and they don't fully understand. They don't they don't get why they believe a lot of this stuff. They haven't looked into it and researched all of the crazy stuff that they believe and their reasons for believing it. So that's 5% and then 10 to 15%. And then I would say 20% of the country believe that the Bible is a real literal story and Adam and Eve were real literal people and they rode dinosaurs. They rode on their backs on saddles. Now, every number that I gave you is based on studies that I've read and surveys and polls and scientific data. And the latest data point that I just got was that 20% number. This is from Gallup. Fewer in U.S. now see Bible as literal word of God. It's a brand new poll just came out. May 1st, 2022, 20% of the country actually believe that the Bible is the real literal word of God to be taken literally, as opposed to 24% in 2017 and 28% in 2014. So it's going down currently. I think what's happening right now is the United States is getting more polarized. So people are getting more extreme. But as these groups get more extreme, they hemorrhage people. They used to be at 30% in 2011. All the way back in 1980, 40% of the country believed that the Bible is the actual word of God to be taken literally. But as things got more extreme, as these people got more radical and nutty and demanded more of an investment of your time and money and attention and life, slowly but surely they started losing people little by little. This is exactly how cults form. This is exactly the pattern that I see with cults all the time. The more extreme a religion, the higher the investment that somebody has to make to be a part of it, whether that be a time investment, a financial investment, an emotional investment, you know, giving up friends or family or whatever it is, the bigger the investment that they have to make, the fewer people they're going to bring in, but the more devoted those members will be when they get there. And that's what we're seeing play out right now with the Republican Party and with evangelicalism. So I would say it comes in concentric circles to answer you more directly. And once again, 5% are deep extremists, like point of no return kind of nutcases. 10 to 15% believe a lot of the same things as those 5%, but aren't as mentally or emotionally invested in it as they are, not quite as much. And then 20% are a little bit closer to reality, but still not in the same reality as us. Believe that the Bible is literally the word of God, and you know Adam and Eve were real people, reject evolution, and all that stuff. Hopefully that answered the question for you. Hey, Owen, this is Chris from Texas again. I just want to know your thoughts on the concepts of sin and original sin. Because after giving it a lot of thought, I realized that they're incredibly cynical, unhealthy, and even authoritarian ideas. Like the idea that humans are inherently selfish 
and evil, and the only thing keeping them from just mass murdering others is adherence to a specific dogma of a specific culture. So, yeah, it just it seems like a very harmful and manipulative belief. Uh, I just want to know your thoughts on that, and thanks for all your work. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, absolutely agree with you on that point. The concept of original sin is deeply disturbing in a lot of ways. A long, long, long time ago, before I was real, I, mean, I may have been a YouTuber at the time, but I wasn't big yet. I didn't have like any listeners or anything, maybe 40 subbies at the time. If that, there was this preacher who was making the rounds on Atheist YouTube who was presented with that. What, what you just said, like, are you saying that, you know, you want to murder people and the only thing that's preventing you from doing so is God? In this guy's case, he was actually railing against homosexuality. And they were like, you're telling us that the only thing that's preventing you from being gay is your love for God. You're not connecting the dots on this? Like, it, are you really buckling down into this logic? And the guy said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely insisted that everybody wants to be gay. Every male has an interest in men. It's only because they have morals from the Bible that they don't get into gay relationships. And people were like, that means you're gay then, right? Because, you know, the people talking about it, like the atheists, they were like, I'm straight. I don't have any interest in this. If you do, it means you're probably gay. And then the guy, the preacher, I don't remember the name of the preacher or what the context was, but he told us about a time when he was not religious yet. He was a young kid and he went to jail and had a boyfriend there and gave up his sinful ways to become a preacher. And he wants everybody to give up their sinful ways. He honestly really did believe everybody was gay in their hearts. The only reason that they don't live that way is because the Bible says it's wrong. The only reason people don't murder is because the Bible says it's wrong. That's it. That's the only thing. That is deeply weird, deeply disturbing that he views things that way. And I think that guy should probably be watched by the FBI for the rest of his life. I mean, it's been a while. I don't even remember who he was now. It's, I don't know. It's probably been eight years, honestly. And I've only been on YouTube for six. So it was a pretty old clip and it'd be hard to find. But I would love to cover that one of these days if I could find it. Anyway, the whole thing is depraved and disturbing and doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The only reason it makes any sense to anybody is because they grew up hearing it and listening to people tell them that it, it made sense. So in your child mind... Like, it makes sense to them. Maybe I'll just understand it when I'm older and you just kind of accept it as fact. Only it never does make sense as you get older. It never did. We just continued to accept it blindly. So yeah, uh, absolutely on the same page with you on that. Complete nonsense. Original sin is ridiculous. The Trinity is ridiculous and unbiblical. There are a lot of things that are ridiculous and unbiblical. In fact, the Bible itself is kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Next, we're going to talk about Lance Walnau's Bizarre Confusing Christian Nationalist Conference. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. Lance Walna is this pro-Trump Christian nationalist that held this bizarre event recently. Now, I talked about that event on my main channel today, and I also talked about the event on my unfiltered channel recently. That hasn't released yet. It's on its way out. But I wanted to go over a little bit of this event because it got real wacky. Lance Walna, if you're unfamiliar, if you've ever seen my channel trailer, he's the guy that was praying over the cardboard cutout of Donald Trump. Watch this. I pray, Lord, that you'll take the smoke away, but you'll give him a revelation. That this is early January 2022 when this released. He is nothing but an instrument of yours, and that as an instrument, you have your hand on him so that, Lord, he won't be moving in anger or bitterness or, or, or rage, but you'll take that away from him and show him 
that he's but an instrument and that he's being used by the hand of providence. Now, needless to say, this guy, I mean, you haven't seen a picture of him yet because he's just been praying over this cardboard cutout of Donald Trump, bizarrely. But here's what he looks like. This one is from mid-October 2020. We're going to listen to this clip in a second. But the whole thing here is many people coming here will be fully aware that there's this Christian nationalist, extremist, Christian Taliban type of movement growing in the United States right now, right? Most people are aware of that at this moment. He is one of the leaders of it. He is pushing the machine forward. He is extremely influential in the evangelical movement, and he weaponizes his, you know, church members, I guess you could call them, or or watchers, because like I say, he's a televangelist. He's not just like a megachurch pastor. He weaponizes his listeners to attack people he doesn't like to vote the way he wants them to vote i mean this is exactly what the founding fathers explicitly said they didn't want to happen and he's doing it so anyways with that context in mind let me show you this clip this one came out mid-october 2020 as i said this is before the actual votes were cast in the 2020 election Watch what he says. I believe Donald Trump has unfinished business in the nations. And I believe you will not let someone who has stood with Israel and stood with Christians, you will not let them be ingloriously beaten and embarrassed by your enemies because your name is part of this, Lord. Ooh, yeah, um, about that. I guess Donald Trump was ingloriously beaten despite the notion that God's name was part of it. That's embarrassing. See, this is the reason why you don't come out of the woodwork and make false prophecies, because there's a very real possibility those false prophecies are going to fall flat. And Lance Walna is fully aware of that concept. He knows it's a bad idea to make false prophecies. As a matter of fact, I don't know how long you've been watching me. Maybe it's your first time here, but there's this woman that I talk about from time to time named Kat Kerr. She's interesting. She seems very nice. I try to say something nice about everybody. She seems very nice. She does not live in reality with the rest of us. She believes that she travels to heaven on a daily basis and hangs out with God, literally physically travels to heaven and paints pictures of God and stuff like that. And unfortunately, you know, we could just ignore her if it weren't for the fact that she is actively forming out policy for U.S. members of Congress and for the president. I mean, not the current one, but Donald Trump. She influenced domestic policy because she's so incredibly influential. Well, as it turns out, Lance Walna does not like her very much, weirdly. I'm honestly surprised because they're both part of the exact same movement. I believe this came out after the inauguration. Two days after Biden was inaugurated, Lance Walna came out and said this because Kat Kerr absolutely could not give up on the idea that Donald Trump lost the election. She couldn't give up on it. She's saying it was stolen and that Trump won and all this other crazy stuff like going completely unhinged. Oh, my God. If you want to see her go totally unhinged, I've released videos about it in the past. But this was Lance Walna's response to Kat Kerr doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on the idea that Trump won the election, despite the fact that Biden was inaugurated. Ministers are busy obsessing over a woman with pink hair who... That's, that's Kat Kerr. A woman with pink hair who refuses to recant her prophecy that Trump will be in office. You know, prophets lose their own credibility with rational people. After a while, they have to recognize that they missed it. The prophets tend to um, end up exposing themselves because if they prophesy something that doesn't happen, don't you think they know it didn't happen? And the Mets will win the World Series. Well, what if they don't? I'm holding on. God told me and they're going to win. It may take a year, but they'll be winning it. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in elections either. It's fascinating to me that he came out and said that because all of the people that he works with on a regular basis explicitly said Donald Trump is going to win the election. In fact, he said those words. And when he didn't, they took that tactic that he just outlined. 
Well, it's, it's going to happen. Might take a year, but j- just wait and see. Well, what if it doesn't? It's bizarre to me that he doesn't seem to be applying his own logic to his own situation or to his friends. It's easy to call out somebody like Kat Kerr, who isn't necessarily in his, like, circle of fellow prophets or whatever. But your circle of fellow prophets is doing the exact same thing, and he's not calling them out. Blows my mind. Anyway, keep listening to his Trump prophecy here. This Lord. What will the heathens say? What will the radicals say? What will the communists say when someone who stands with you so conspicuously is that does not have a friend in high places watching over them? But I believe you are going to watch over this president. Ouch. Wow, that's rough. As it turns out, either it can only be one of two things at this point. Either God wanted Joe Biden to be involved. God wanted Joe Biden to win. God didn't like the guy who has broken every commandment in the book, all 613 of the old laws at one point or another. God didn't like the guy who pretended to be religious just to gain the religious votes. God didn't like that guy who talks trash constantly, indulges in the seven deadly sins on a regular basis. Either God didn't like that guy and he chose Joe Biden or... God isn't involved in U.S. politics at all. It can only be one of these two things. But in Lance Walnaut's mind, and in the mind of his friends, of his fellow prophets, as they call each other, God actually did choose Donald Trump, and Donald Trump actually did win. It's just Joe Biden is more powerful than God and overthrew God's choice, apparently. After watching a recent episode of this televangelist's TV show, I don't think this guy is genuine at all. I deeply believe this guy is a scam artist. I really do, and we'll get there. I'll explain why in a minute. But it blows my mind that people believe him. I don't think he believes what he's saying. It blows my mind that others believe what he's saying. So about that episode, it was a TV show called Flashpoint, and it's on the Victory Network. Uh, Victory Network is a TV network on, I, I don't know, Direct TV and Dish and all of the cable packages. And it's owned by Kenneth Copeland. And on Flashpoint, you've got four televangelists. You've got Lance Walna, Mario Murillo, Hank Kuhneman, and Dutch Sheets. Those are usually the four that show up. Sometimes they have guests. Sometimes they have others, whatever else. But those are the four pillars, right? And then you got Gene Bailey, the host. And they go through the crowd and they prophesy and they lay hands on people and all this other stuff. The usual, you know. Well, I watched the July 1st episode. It's obviously a little bit old at this point, but it was still deeply weird to watch. On this Flashpoint episode, they invite this woman here. Her name's Abby. I'm not sure what her last name is, but she was on to talk about abortion. Listen to what she had to say on the subject of abortion. Remember, this is like a televangelist TV show, so it's, it's like a, a live church service, what it's supposed to be. Check this out, July 1st. Now listen, I grew up in a, a wonderful Southern Baptist church. Now, I grew up hearing about the sin of homosexuality. I grew up hearing about the sin of adultery. That doesn't surprise me that she grew up hearing about those two things. What she's referring to are like the Old Testament laws right now. Homosexuality and adultery were outlined in the Old Testament laws. But okay, let's keep going. I grew up hearing about the necessity of tithing. Again, that's heavily Old Testament. I mean, I think these are all mentioned in New Testament, but they really hammer down on all of them in the Old Testament. I never, ever heard about the sin of abortion. Okay, well, that makes sense because the Bible doesn't say that it's a sin in the first place. At no point anywhere ever does the Bible say that abortion is a sin. In fact, it not only does it tell you that you should get abortions in some cases, it explains how to get them. It explains the process that you go through to induce one. The weird part isn't that you didn't hear about the sin of abortion. The weird part is that you're telling us that it's a sin. That directly contradicts what the Bible says. And if you don't believe me, let's just take a look. Let's read the Bible verses that explain to you when and how 
to get an abortion. It can be found in Numbers 5, 11 to 31. I'm just going to read like a little excerpt of it to give you an idea of the Bible's position on this subject, okay? We're starting in verse 12. If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has relations with her and this is hidden from her husband and their impurity is undetected since there's no witness against her and she's not been caught in the act because they didn't have DNA tests back then, of course. And if feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife that she is impure, or if he's jealous and suspects her even though she's not impure, then he's to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah, an ephah, uh, of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had relations with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that the abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. That is a very specific endorsement of abortion and a description of how to do it. Now, it was incorrect, obviously, because they didn't have the scientific knowledge that we have today. But what they're describing here is an explicit endorsement, in fact, a command to get an abortion in certain cases. So it seems to me that Abby doesn't really understand the Bible, like at all. Has she even read it? Has she read the parts that talk about abortion? I mean, she's talking about the sin of abortion, right? Does she know anything about what the Bible has to say on the subject? Obviously not. She wouldn't be calling it a sin otherwise. I never, ever heard about the sin of abortion. Ever. Yeah, everyone's quiet. Like, oh, we dropped the ball. We're pastors and we didn't talk about this. Well, what Bible verses do you expect them to use exactly? Because the Bible explicitly endorses this. What Bible verses are you going to come up with that tell you that abortion is a sin or whatever? If I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. In all seriousness, the Bible is such a broad-ranging book, so thick. It's like thousands of pages, 66 books written by dozens of authors across thousands of years, and every author had a different opinion on everything. If there is a position that you hold, you can find a Bible verse to back it up because it's so far-reaching, so broad. There are so many verses in it. I'm sure she could find a couple little basic verses in there that say something that imply that abortion is wrong. But I feel like the verse I read pretty explicitly endorses it. That's just what it seems like to me. All right, let's keep listening. I've had two abortions in my life. The Sunday before I had my first abortion, I sat in church. Okay, I don't know what church she was going to it seems like she was kind of implying that she always went to like a bible thumping fundamentalist baptist church right baptists aren't usually okay with that so i i don't know why she would i think this is a made-up story honestly like the things she's saying aren't really adding up but okay the sunday after i had my abortion i sat in church Okay, yeah. So, anyway, the point is, I just don't know that she's even telling the truth. Like, it seems like a fabricated story to me. So, needless to say, the entire episode that we watched on the Telltale Unfiltered channel, like this whole thing that we're talking about right now, was bizarre. 
deeply, deeply bizarre and unbiblical. Here's another part of that episode that we watched. In this section, they were talking about election fraud. They don't believe in the separation between church and state at all. These people don't. So naturally, they endorse Trump for president and whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. They don't care about losing tax exempt status, which is, you know, it's clearly against the law to endorse or oppose specific candidates for office, but they don't care. They'll do whatever. So anyway, the point is, he was talking about election fraud in this section. Listen to what he had to say here. He's talking about Democrats committing election fraud specifically. They didn't. But listen to what he said about it. These people have given their consciences over to the devil. That means that they're lying, they know they're lying, and they're beginning to believe their own lies. Projection much? The, oh, this means the Marjorie Taylor Greene is up here, an entrepreneur, Christian woman. Oh, yeah, they invited Marjorie Taylor Greene up to, to give a weird speech, and it was as unhinged as you would imagine it was. Why is she, why are we celebrating her? She came out like any of you out of the rank and file of a populist movement. She just rose up and said, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a businesswoman, this stuff's crazy. Well, God put his anointing on her. Let's pray right now that in this room... The Flashpoint Army, you're all called to go take some territory somewhere. And we're calling for new politicians to rise up, new school board members, new legislators, watchmen that really are watching. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone watching this right now, that same Marjorie Taylor Greene anointing of the populist people rising up into spheres of influence. Everybody at this event is an extremist. There, everybody there is a radical to the highest degree. When you're attending a Flashpoint event on the Victory Network, your mind is gone. It belongs to televangelists, and so does your bank account by that point. The idea of anybody in this room, one single person, getting involved in politics is deeply, deeply disturbing. And the even more disturbing thing to imagine here is the fact that every one of these people are involved in politics. Every single one of them votes. They view it as a religious mandate. If they don't vote for Donald Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene or whoever else, they're going to hell. That's how they view this. Just that level alone of political involvement is disturbing. But it's going beyond that. He wants them to run for office like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Run for school board seats. There are school board members that believe this way. Deeply disturbing stuff. People rising up into spheres of influence. You're going to step into your assignment. Yeah, deeply, deeply disturbing, man. I'm telling you. Okay, so in this next clip, this is just like a minute or two after that. He comes out on stage and he decides to do this exorcism. He's going to exorcise the crowd of demons. Now, let me draw a picture of what these people believe. Generally, they believe any ailment of of any kind at all, depression or cancer or anything, literally anything, diabetes, is all due to a demon that's possessing you. And you need... Deliverance Ministry, also known as an exorcism, to exorcise the demon from your body. That's how they view the world. That's what they believe. So Lance Walnut is about to perform an exorcism on the crowd, and it gets weird. Listen to this. Some of you are feeling almost your hands right now like there's almost like there's a there's a It's weird. It's like an air on them, or it's like almost, I can't describe it, but it's like air blowing on my hands right now. What he's doing here is a common psychological technique where he's describing a sensation and giving that sensation to the crowd. Tells them to do something like hold their hands out and close their eyes and imagine the feeling of an egg cracking above you and then falling down your back it hits your head and then it falls down your back i mean this is a common psychological technique that that he's pulling right now can feel something on my hands almost like air blowing on it you know 
this is part of him linking the crowd to him and getting them in a meditative trance-like state to be more malleable, more susceptible to influence. Keep listening. It's weird. It's like an air on Amara. It's like almost, I can't describe it, but it's like air blowing on my hands right now. I could feel the substance of something coming onto my hands. And when people actually feel that substance, as their brains will make them feel, they believe that they're feeling the Holy Ghost. They'll believe that God is in the room with them or that Lance Walna gave them this supernatural experience. It's a way of convincing them that what he's saying and doing is legit. Out of your body, I command every guilt. You just repent right now to the Lord about whatever it's been that you've been holding on to because you're not going to leave this arena with the condemnation, the guilt, the torment, or the disqualification. Yeah, they had just spent the past, I don't know, hour or so talking about how evil abortion is and how that one woman, Abby, had like two of them or something and she washed her hands of it and was forgiven by God. So now he's trying to convince people to go over there and get baptized and ask for forgiveness for their sin of abortion. Again, I don't know how they arrived at the idea that abortion is a sin. That's unbiblical, but okay. Let's keep listening. Vacation. Into your hands right now, I command the guilt, the heaviness, the demonic strongholds. Now watch what we're going to do on the count of three. You're going to go whoosh, like that. And I'm telling you, there's a deliverance. It's going it's to pull right off of you. Deliverance ministry is exorcism. So what he's doing right now is exercising demons from the crowd. And now it gets wild. Listen to this. Deliverance is going to pull right off of you. Ready for this? The crowd is completely stone-faced because they believe that a demon just flew out of some person in the crowd that just screamed their lungs out. This person is so completely convinced that they were possessed by a demon that was just exercised from their body that right in the middle of everything, a crowd of 10,000 people probably, everything is completely silent. They scream out as they believe a demon leaves their body. It doesn't get more fantasy land like than this. Like people are so deeply entrenched in delusion at this event. I just don't even know where to go with this. This is nuts. Ready for this? One, two, three, whoosh! Wow. That's it. It's that simple. Holy Spirit, I thank you now. Now fill them. If you've got a prayer language, pray in tongues. Now get that place filled up. Fill it up fast. Now they're speaking in tongues. Absolutely bizarre, man. Absolutely bizarre. This event was so, so strange to watch. I think it was like two hours long total or something. And like I said, I broke down the entire event beginning to end, including the parts where Marjorie Taylor Greene gave her weird little speech and everything. I talked about it all on Twitch recently. It's going to be releasing to my Telltale Unfiltered channel in the next week, probably. So keep a lookout on there if you want to see it. But yeah, absolutely fascinating to listen to this and disturbing at the same time. After watching what Lance Walnut had to say at this event, like not just what we've seen here necessarily, but like the entire event that I saw on Telltale Unfiltered, I think this guy's a scam artist. I really do. I didn't always think that. That's not my default position. I try to be charitable and not assume the worst of people, but after seeing the things that he said and did at this event, I can't imagine that he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments or on Twitter, at Telltale Atheist. Next, we're going to talk about the top QAnon interpreter dusting off his keyboard because the leader of the QAnon movement is back. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description.
The guy on the right here goes by the moniker, The Praying Medic. Now, he is as influential as it gets in the QAnon movement. If you're not very familiar with the QAnon movement, we've got a lot to learn tonight. It's going to be an absolutely fascinating ride, in my opinion. QAnon doesn't have prophets, exactly. They don't really have prophecies because religion is an integral part of it. But it isn't really a religious cult, exactly. Like, you have to be religious to believe the QAnon ideology, but it isn't a religious cult. Instead of prophets, they have what they call interpreters. And the praying medic, the guy on the right here, is the top QAnon interpreter. QAnon is a movement that started back in 2016 to 2017. I think it really started in 2017. A message board that operates very similarly to Reddit. It's called 4chan, except everybody is completely and totally 100% anonymous, and there is pretty much no moderation. You can say or do or post absolutely anything with no consequences whatsoever on this website called 4chan. So this guy called himself Q Clearance Patriot starts posting about how Hillary Clinton is about to be arrested by the National Guard and a, a whole bunch of other crazy claims. Yeah, I can't find the original post, but he basically said that Hillary Clinton was going to be arrested by the National Guard on this day at this time, and she was on the move, and she's running, and blah. It was just crazy stuff. Of course, it never happened. None of the predictions that QAnon ever made happened, but it doesn't matter. People believed it anyways. They believed that they had this guy who was a high-ranking member of government and had the inside scoop on what was happening and was posting this stuff that they call Q drops to leave little breadcrumbs to lead people to correct conclusions about what's happening in the world without actually ever saying anything about classified information. They're just leaving the breadcrumbs for these interpreters to pick up. So these interpreters pick up on these little breadcrumbs, these little confusing, vague breadcrumbs, and they spin up a whole story out of it. It's all complete nonsense from beginning to end, but some of the conclusions that this Q guy, this poster, called himself Q, some of the conclusions that he led these people to are that JFK Jr. is still alive and actually running the country with President Trump right now behind the scenes. Biden is a demon in a cloned body of the original Joe Biden. Hillary Clinton does these ritual sacrifices and absolutely naughty stuff. Anyway, this is the guy right here on the right that made a lot of those interpretations that was reading what this Q poster was writing and inferring what he thought he meant, basically. After Trump lost the election, the Q poster walked away completely, stopped posting. I heard a rumor at the time, unverified, who knows if it's true, take it with a grain of salt, that the QAnon account was for sale for a million dollars. I don't know if that's true. After the election ended, Q completely walked away. Well, this guy on the right here, praying medic, he just came out with new stuff because guess what? Q, the original poster, is back. So the praying medic is dusting off his keyboard to go on another trek one more time with the poster Q. So I wanted to take a look at the latest Q drops, what they call them, and praying medic's interpretations of some of this stuff. But before we actually get into it, let me just show you who this guy is. This is from May 2019. This is the praying medic, Dave Hayes is his real name describing what he believes is going to happen and he thinks he interpreted this from some top secret military mind who's pretending to be some anonymous guy on 4chan listen to this q has often said especially over the last six months this is going to be the end of the d party the end of the democrat party he uses code a lot instead of ever just coming out and saying democratic party he just says the d party i don't know why he wants to sound cryptic probably okay now if you are you know average person listening watching q like what do you mean the end of the democrat party the democrat party is not going to end yes it is yeah and i'm going to explain to you how the democrat party is going to end what we are going to see in the next year unrolled. Oh, that's specific. This is May 2019. 
And this guy's telling us by May 2020, before the election even took place, I think before the primaries even finished, there were going to be mass arrests and the Democratic Party is going to be over for good. That's going to be the end of it. Another prime example of a false prediction, a false prophecy, effectively, that was made by QAnon and the QAnon interpreters. What we are going to see in the next year unrolled is likely hundreds of members of Congress, most of them Democrats, some Republicans, all right, they're going to be arrested and they're going to be prosecuted for corruption. Because he believes that the vast majority of corruption that takes place in government is done by Democrats. He believes that Republicans are mostly, they, they mostly have clean hands. Wow. Simply wow. Q said that people in Congress were warned the storm is coming. Oh, and the storm refers to this event that we're talking about here, where people in government are, you know, mass arrested and brought to justice and everything is cleaned out and blah, blah, blah. It's like their end times prediction. The storm is a reference to their end times days. And they were told, if you are playing the game and you are in Congress, when the storm hits, you're going to be prosecuted. They saw the storm coming and oh. they were like, OK, I'm out. They were cut a deal. You get out. You won't be prosecuted. If you stay in, the hammer is going to fall on yes. you. You're going to be prosecuted. Later, he goes on to talk about Republicans that decided not to run again in 2020. They just they, they walked out of Congress. They were done with their political career or whatever. He believes that those people quit Congress because they were trying to avoid the storm. So some time passes. Obviously, he gets prediction after prediction wrong. After the election, QAnon disappears. Well, the poster, Q, disappears from the internet, stops posting, stops talking, stops anything. Surprisingly, the praying medic sticks around, continues talking about this stuff for years afterward. So December 2020 was QAnon's last post, I believe or the Q, Q posters last post. December 2020. This is the praying medic's last mention of QAnon for a little while. Early February 2022. So this dude stuck it out for a year and three months, basically, after Q stopped posting. He stuck it out that entire time. And he never stopped believing it either. Even though he started talking about other stuff like healing people through the power of God and filling your gas tank by praying over it and all kinds of crazy stuff, he still believed in QAnon, despite moving on to another subject. Listen to what he had to say about the movement early February 2022. Q had not re returned yet at this point. No one has been more pissed off at Q than me uh for the you know three years we sat through of waiting for the arrests thinking that the arrests were just around the corner like it was just gonna mm -hmm. happen and this this next week we're gonna see people arrested and and it never happened uh so i, I have you know as much frustration as anyone does I'm just blown away that the dude actually believed this stuff. And he was like the top guy in the movement underneath Q. He never communicated with Q as far as I know, he just interpreted the things that he wrote. Absolutely bizarre stuff, man. As anyone does, about how long we've been waiting for the arrest to happen. However, just, yeah. um, Q did warn us on the front end of the conversation that a lot of what he was gonna put out was gonna be disinformation. Yeah, very true. Uh, information, dis dis disinformation designed to make the bad guys make wrong moves so you had to get real with that if you're going to buy on to the to the q thing you have to know up front half of what q is going to tell you is not going to be true it's for the it's for the purpose of psychological operations and that's just how it is that is so deeply sad this guy was tricked and lied to obviously and it is right in his face and undeniable at this point and what is his response? Not Q is completely full of it and has no idea what he's talking about. His response is, 
he's doing that to help us catch the bad guys. It does not get much more sad than that. After Q disappeared for that time, he went on this trail talking about Jesus instead. So listen to what he has to say. This is June 21st, 2022. This is on Mary Grace's, what, Facebook page, I think. She's on Facebook on this. I've been teaching people the basics of uh, releasing power, exercising authority, emotional healing. Yeah, he's trying to find some new focus in his life. This took up his entire world. This is everything that he was about. He was an author that used to write books. I mean, there were terrible books about how to heal people with your mind and stuff, but... You know, the, he was making a living that way, and he stopped writing books for years. Two years, at least, he stopped writing his passion because he was following Q. Wasted his life on this. And now, since Q disappeared, he decided to go back to talking about spiritual healing or, or whatever, apparently. Exercising authority, emotional healing, deliverance, hearing God's voice, you know, words of knowledge. All of that, all of those sort of things on Telegram now for what seven, eight months, and we're getting testimonies every day from people who are, who have never seen miracles, never seen a healing before, supernatural healing. They're praying for themselves. They're praying for their dogs, their cats, their horses, uh, their friends, and they're seeing miracles. They're praying over their refrigerators and broken appliances. They're praying over their what? <laughs> what was that? Please repeat, Dave their cats, their horses, uh, their friends, and they're seeing miracles. They're praying over their refrigerators and broken appliances. We're, gas uh, we're just seeing. Okay. Uh, I didn't know that God was an electrician. This is news to me, but uh, thank you so much for, see, these are things I wouldn't know if I didn't listen to Dave Hayes. What is going through this guy's head, honestly? So power is energy. And power is the energy to work creative miracles. If you had were born with no eye or no optic nerve, or if you had uh, in your knee in your, a meniscus, your meniscus in your knee was shredded and destroyed and you needed a new one, new eye, new nerve, new meniscus. All right. What I'm going to do is release power to work a creative miracle. You're going to get a new meniscus in your knee. Dude, I'm going to have so many wrinkles when I get older. It's going to be just a train wreck. My face is going to be a train wreck when I get older from watching this shit right here. So he is a special denomination of Christianity called a charismatic. I had never heard of it before. And I may do a, a long form video talking about what it is in more detail, but that's what he identifies as a charismatic. So he starts going down this path starts talking about God and how great he is and how he can heal your refrigerator if you pray over it and all this other stuff. And then Q returns and his entire life derails again. Apparently, supposedly, I heard from the praying medic, the account at Q on Truth Social, Donald Trump's Twitter clone, is the oldest account in existence on that platform, just at Q. And it's supposed to be the actual Q, who, by the way, if you don't know, we're very confident we know exactly who it is. It's a guy who calls himself Code Monkey, also known as Ron Watkins and his father, Jim Watkins. In my opinion, they are Q. I'm very, very confident. He likes to threaten lawsuits for people who make that claim. So I'm just saying it's my opinion. Don't take me to court. I'm looking for the latest Q posts. Hang on. Let's try Duck, Duck, Go. Uh, Daily Dot, Independent, The Guardian. I'm not looking for reputable websites, search engine. I'm looking for the trash ones. Where are the trash websites? You can't find the latest Q posts without going to the deepest, darkest corners of the internet. Please, let me find them. Wow, they really don't want me finding the Q posts. With good reason. I think that the QAnon posts should be censored from the internet. I, I actually do. It is a neo-Nazi movement, an extremist movement that has actually caused violence in the real world and is extremely dangerous to democracy and society. I can't find the latest one, but I'll just give you an idea of what was said. Uh, when they returned, they said something to the effect of, are you ready to play another game or something like that? And 
Great. That that was kind of what they said originally, like when they very first start, are you ready to play a game? Something like that. And then their next post was something to the effect of it had to be this way or it had to be done this way. So this is the praying medic reviewing some of the newer Q posts after those that came out recently. Listen to this. June 29th, 2022. This is his breakdown of one of the newer ones. Just kind of give you an idea of his process and how it works and how he thinks and what the Q posts look like. Q was posting in the middle of the night. Uh, early this morning, we got a message on the board from Q. A little bit after midnight, Pacific time zone, Q posted this. What is at stake? Who has control? Surprise witness. Who was surprised? Who will be surprised? Use your logic. Can emotions be used to influence decisions? How do you control emotion? Define plant. How do you insert a plant? Can emotions be used to insert a plant? Who is Cassidy Hutchinson? Trust a plan. Q. So that's the entire Q post. One of the more recent ones came out like last month or something like that. There are somewhere around 5,000 of these posts. The Q drops contain roughly as many words as there are words in the Bible or somewhere in there. It's all nonsense like this, you know, who will be surprised, who was surprised, surprise witness, who has control? Can emotions be used to influence decisions? It's just, it, it's like a, a, what do you call it? Like an Easter egg hunt, or it, it's like a, an episode of Murder, She Wrote. This generally attracts an older demographic of people who like solving puzzles, and that's what this is inviting people to do, solve puzzles. Hunt the internet for the answers to what this guy is talking about and come up with the most batshit insane conspiracy theories you can along the way all right so this is a post obviously about the testimony of cassidy hutchinson yesterday the surprise witness at the january 6th committee hearing so yesterday she testified before the committee and said that president trump became enraged when his alleged request to be taken to the capitol was not honored by the secret service okay so when president trump realized that cassidy hutchinson had retained a new attorney Julian's Rome began digging and learned that the attorney worked as an assistant attorney general under Jeff Sessions and was a key witness in the Mueller investigation. Here's a post by President Trump yesterday on True Social. So the entire ideology revolves around Donald Trump, and they believe that Q has some special link to Trump because Donald Trump and the Q account tend to post drops or tweets or whatever within a couple minutes of each other every single time so there are like two minutes between when q said something and when trump said something i mean naturally if donald trump is sitting there tweeting every single day constantly you know sending out 30 40 50 tweets a day and we know that he's usually sitting on the toilet around 5 a.m or or you know 9 p.m or something like that seems like a pretty straightforward idea for Q to just get on there and start typing out Q drops about something that's really, really relevant in Donald Trump's life right now around that time. And boom, you've suddenly got what they call a Q proof or a delta. In math, a delta is basically a, an amount of time or a distance or something between two variables. That's what they're talking about when they say delta. There's a zero delta between Donald Trump and Q because they both posted a tweet about a similar subject within a minute of each other. And that's their Q proof that Q really is in government and connected to Trump and all this other crazy nonsense. So anyway, that's the idea behind it. I wanted to kind of show you what it's all about because that's what is just absolutely enrapturing this guy's life right now. Well, he went on this Mary Grace's like Facebook page or whatever. Like I mentioned earlier, we watched we watched a clip of it earlier, but he actually got into the QAnon business and Donald Trump and all of that stuff recently on her podcast too. So I wanted to get into it a little further, just scroll a little bit more into her podcast episode. Let's hear what he had to say. Listen to this one. Again, June 21st, 2022, when he said this. You know why Trump continually 
uses a dollar eighty seven as the price of gas when he's talking about that? Because it's a really low number? Maybe he did. Maybe he did once or twice. Maybe it was every single time. Do you think there's any possibility that maybe you're reading into this a little bit too much? No, that's not crossing his head. It couldn't possibly be that he's reading into this too much because he believes in QAnon, and that's what it's all about. Reading into things too much. That is the basis of the QAnon movement. You have to read into things too much to be a part of the QAnon movement. Okay, so let's hear his description of why Trump uses a dollar eighty-seven to refer to a low gas price. Uh, no. <laughs> Think about the meaning of one eighty-seven. Do I know the meaning of that? Oh, is that like right? So that is Q's code uh, for homicide, and. Uh, the price of gas is going to murder the Democrats in the November election. That's so good. 187. And it, it's always 187 yeah. in, in his posts. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> there's That's, that. I love it. I love it. That's just so awesome. Even the subtext of the, of the conversation has memes in it. Yeah. He's, you know, guys, I, I mean, he, he really is one of those brilliant people. Donald Trump. They're talking about Donald Trump being one of those brilliant people. That's crazy. That's crazy. There are people out there today, right now, that think Donald Trump is one of those truly deeply brilliant people. The battiness does not end there. There was even more battiness to be seen. Again, June 21st, 2022 is from the same episode. I wondered how this guy was going to grapple with Donald Trump's position on the vaccine like he supported the vaccine or currently does right how's he going to grapple with that position believing that vaccines are the most evil thing in the world check this one out well why does President Trump push the vaccine and why does he brag about Operation Warp Speed if he loved our country he wouldn't do that because so many people died I find it fascinating that Trump endorsed the vaccine and they still hate the vaccine. I just want to put it on record right now. The vaccine saved untold numbers of lives. It is deeply incredible that we as a species were even capable of producing a vaccine that could deal with COVID in the first place. And one that was so effective absolutely blows me away. I got the vaccine literally the moment it was available to me. I signed up. Within a day, when I heard that it was available, I signed up for it. And I got two boosters in addition to the original. And you know what happened? My daughter actually caught COVID, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, Omicron. Came home, stayed in the house with us, had a sore throat and sniffles and coughing and the whole nine yards, really sick. I never caught it because I had the vaccine. I was double boosted. Of course, she was double boosted too. But being in a house with somebody who actually actively had it and had symptoms and was testing positive, I never tested positive. And I can only thank the vaccine for that. So I just want to put that on record before listening to her nonsensical characterization of Donald Trump and the vaccine. Let's listen to it. Because so many people died. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding like I'm mocking you, but I am because I've explained this. Operation Warp Speed saved our country from perpetual lockdown. If you think the economy is bad now, if you think things are bad now, imagine what it would have been like if he had listened to Dr. Fauci, baby Mengele, who said, everything's gonna get better when we get a vaccine, we'll get the country open, right? That was, that was code for this country will never open again. Okay, so wow, this is this is a deep conspiracy theory, it seems to me at this point. So Donald Trump comes out and endorses the vaccine, says that people should be getting vaccinated, and a bunch of anti-vaxxers and, and Q supporters get really, really upset over it because they believe that the vaccine is like super evil and blah, blah, blah. There's this huge plot by Dr. Fauci, whatever. And their explanation for why they still love Donald Trump despite the fact that he's endorsing the vaccine is Trump had to push out a cure or whatever because if he didn't 
allow them to push out a cure sooner rather than later, then it would be perpetual lockdowns. That is a level of mental gymnastics I can't even touch. So it seems to me that they're implicitly admitting that the vaccine is helpful, right? It's so hard to like sift your way through their bizarre beliefs. Because look how long it's taken them to find a cure for cancer. Never did it. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Um, Cancer isn't a virus. Cancer isn't a bacteria. There's a distinct difference. We aren't locking people down for cancer because it doesn't pass from person to person like that. She can't not know this, right? She must know this. There is no logic to be found in these people. So the race for the cure to coronavirus would be a never-ending grift of money laundering to big pharma to find the cure. That's complete nonsense. China came out with a vaccine. So did Russia. If the United States hadn't come out with a vaccine sooner rather than later, we would have just purchased a whole bunch from China or we would have purchased the patents for it or whatever else. It's just complete nonsense. It's all speculation built on assumption, built on nonsense from the ground up. That's what it is. It's all speculation built on nonsense, built on assumptions, built on Donald Trump and their love for him. Everything revolves around that. Everything that they say somehow has to route back to Donald Trump being the greatest, being the best. They bought the guy's own delusion about himself. You guys understand that. That's what this was about. And Trump knew that the social and emotional, political and economic cost of locking this country down for even more than 15 days would be devastating. That's why he said, we're going to get the country open, open the country, get the kids back in school. He did that to save your country. Their plan, according to uh, an article in the New York Times, actually, was to roll these vaccines out over the course of 12 years. So this guy believes that the U.S. was going to stay locked down for 12 years. People aren't going to be allowed to go outside for 12 years until the vaccine is passed out to everybody? Seriously, like, what what kind of a delusion do they live in? I try desperately not to use that word lightly because it's a serious condition, a serious mental condition that people experience. In the case of QAnon, I believe they're experiencing a delusional state or they're accepting a delusional state as reality. Absolutely unhinged from reality. No other way to put it, honestly. Watch this clip. This is from November 21st, 2021. But in 2016, God started giving me dreams about politics and current events, and especially Trump. I've had, gosh, probably 200 dreams about Trump. Wow. Over the last five years, and uh, and probably almost as many dreams about Q. I know I've had at least 100 dreams where uh, God has highlighted specific things about Q's operation that he wanted me to know. And that's significant because he believes that God endorses Q and Donald Trump. He believes that these dreams are coming from God. He thinks they're prophetic dreams. He is a prophetic dreamer. And the dreams that he has are prophetically significant. He worships Trump. He is part of his ideology, part of his theology at this point. Seriously, I don't say that lightly. So, like you said, uh, you know, I got dragged into this unwillingly. I really did not want to get into um, politics and current events, but it seemed like that's what God wanted me to do. I continually see the same thing when I take an afternoon nap. And I'm talking about a nap for like 10 minutes, all right? A disco nap. Boom, I, I go into this dream and I see things going on behind the scenes. And it always has to do with the takedown of corruption. Like I see people testifying in hearings. I see people talking about um, what what the deep state's plans are. I, I see people um, revealing uh, classified information about corruption. Wow. So you have the inside track on what classified information the U.S. has. So you can prove this to people, right? This should be easily provable. No. He never comes out with this classified information, or if he does, 
None of it can ever be proven. Nothing that he says can ever be proven in any way because it's all nonsense. I honestly feel bad for these people. I wish that there was something I could do to help them find their way out. Deeply disappointing that there are so many people in the U.S. right now who buy this. He has made Donald Trump part of his religion at this point. I do not say that lightly. If you disagree with me on that or anything else I've talked about, let me know in the comments or hit me up on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. Next, we're going to talk about Roger Stone claiming to be a Christian nationalist so he can take advantage of their persecution complex. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. Roger Stone has been mentioned in the January 6th hearings a lot lately for some stuff that he said and did. I don't know if you're familiar with this guy, but he actually worked in the Nixon administration. At, I'm not sure what his level of involvement was, but generally speaking, this is the guy on screen right here, Roger Stone. For the most part, you can consider him an enforcer, somebody that goes in and breaks the law and demands pardons or he's going to blow the lid off of everything. He was heavily involved in the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon, and he's been heavily involved in the January 6th scandals with Donald Trump and every other scandal that Trump has taken part in. Apparently, Roger Stone's been friends with Donald Trump since like, you know, I, I, for 30 years or something like that. Anyway, this article is by the New York Times. Title is Group Chat Linked to Roger Stone Shows Ties Among January 6th Figures. So I'll, I'll give you the bottom line. Basically, Roger Stone was communicating with the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and some other extremist militias in the U.S. for Donald Trump. He's communicating with them for Trump and telling them what Trump wanted them to do on January 6th giving them documents that they needed and working out a plan with them and everything on Trump's behalf. That's what the January 6th hearings revealed about Roger Stone. I don't know this for a fact, but I also heard, usually I don't try to spread rumors, but I heard a rumor that a while back, Madison Cawthorn, the famous, terrible Republican congressman, a while back he said that some members of Congress, or some people on Capitol Hill, he said, invited him to cocaine-fueled orgies or something like that. And he's basically completely excommunicated from the Republican caucus for those comments. Well, here's the rumor. Rumor has it that Roger Stone was that guy that invited him to that. That's just the kind of guy that Roger Stone is. I mean, he's a well-known swinger goes to these types of parties with his wife all the time and has for like decades. He is what one would consider, what's the word? Not deviant, um, where somebody is just grossly wealthy and do whatever they want. Uh, God, what's the word? Help me out here, guys. Not these nuts. It's not these nuts. That's not the one. Pervert could fit. Pervert could be it. Not delinquent. Decadent. Maybe it's decadent. Yeah, I, I guess it could be decadent. Maybe that was the word that I was trying to come up with. Degenerate. It was degenerate. That's the word I was looking for. It's degenerate. Yes. Uh, he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Just terrible. So anyways, in no way, shape, or form has he ever come across as a Christian. He's never claimed to be a Christian. He's never given us an indication that he believes in any of that. In fact, the, the life that he leads is so completely and totally contrary to what Christians claim to be about. He would absolutely guaranteed be going to hell by any Christian's standards, any Christian, even the wingnuts that you find worshiping Donald Trump, even them, by their standards, he'd be going to hell because of his decadent lifestyle and the debauchery that he engages in. So anyways... As it turns out, he actually came out and claimed to be a Christian recently. He says he was saved by the power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And he goes on this far-right Facebook page with 
roughly, I don't know, 400,000 followers on it or something like that, professes his love for Jesus and claims that there's a portal, a demonic portal above the White House. Now, I talked about this, I don't know, when it happened, a few months ago. April 26, 2022 is when he originally claimed it. So if you want to hear more about this, you can go back on my channel and just look into it. I think it's on my main channel where I talk about it. I just want to give a little bit of lead up to this so you guys have a little information about who Roger Stone is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the demonic portal, and then we're going to get into the meat of the story. So check this out. April 26, 2022. This is him talking about this demonic portal that formed above Biden's White House. So this doesn't have sound, but you see that thing. It looks like a sun behind the clouds or the moon. That has been there for months in the sky. Now, this is a camera. You see some refractal things as this zooms in. You'll see the moon-like thing. It looks like almost the sun. And then you see that red cloudy stuff. And you see the lights within it. And and I, I showed this to Robin on the air. It's literally, I don't know the date we showed it. And, wow, look at those flashes. And I said, let me explain what's happening here. Just from somebody who works in video a lot, like, you know, video editing and things and somebody who was a software engineer for six years, what I'm seeing here is compression artifacts and uncompressed video, uh, especially like a live feed or something like that, would be, it would take up just an absolutely absurd amount of bandwidth. So what they do, let me just give you a basic idea of what compression is. You're a soldier in a war. You're over there in Afghanistan or something, and you write a letter to your loved one, but the letter is too long. Your base commander or whoever tells you you can only write a one-page letter. They will only deliver one page, but your letter is 10 pages long. So what do you do? Anytime you put the word love in the letter, you replace it with the number one. That actually condensed it from 10 pages to one page, surprisingly, like blown away, right? And then you attach a note to the, the love letter, the, one, the now one-page love letter that says, Anytime you see the number one, replace it with the word love. So now your loved one can get the letter and expand it, basically unpack it, unzip it into the full 10-page letter about how much they love you. That's the idea behind compression. That's the idea behind encryption, too. They're basically the same thing. They're extremely similar to each other. Unfortunately, when you compress something like that, like a video feed, for example, you get artifacts. When it unzips it on the other side, it's not perfect. It gets some things wrong. And what you're seeing here with like th this movement and these weird artifacts everywhere where it's flashing and stuff, this is the result of the system not really knowing what's supposed to be there. So it's trying to fill in the gaps based on knowledge about what's surrounding that part and things like that. That's what compression is. That's what's happening here. I just want to debunk the nonsense as it comes out. I feel it's important to do that. So anyway, let's listen to them continue to tell us that it's a ghost or it's a demon or, or whatever it is. We showed it. And wow, look at those flashes. And I said, Robin, is that, what is that? Is that good or evil? The portal is real. It's amazing that the whole occultic world, Steve, knew that on 2-22-222, a portal was going to open. Now, that's all they talked about. They said it was going to open. They, uh, they were going to use this portal and so forth. I want, I want to tell you something about that portal that you just saw. Over see, that. you see the portal, and then you see the, all the, the cloudy flashes and all beside yeah. it. It's compression artifacts at best, and at worst, I'm not even convinced that this is real. I would not put it past Roger Stone or anybody else uh, from the Elijah List, this Facebook page, to completely fabricate this stuff. I'm nearly 100%, I'd say 99% sure they have fabricated stuff. Not just this guy, Steve Schultz, not just Robin Bullock or Roger Stone, but the other guests that they have on this Facebook page regularly. There's that there. circular thing. There you can see it. Uh, There's the demonic portal. It's very, very clear. Uh, it doesn't move day or night. It's harder to see during the day, but you, you see it at night. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely convinced uh, about the inherent. There it is again. 
What was this taken on like a Nokia like flip phone or something? Why is this so grainy? But the inherent evil of what's going on in the White House, what's going on in the country. And I think it's imperative that people know about this, that people of good faith, that Christians know about this. And we begin a, a national, essentially a prayer assault to close the portal. Did it work? Did your prayer assault work to close the portal? See, this is the little trick that these people use. They're going to claim if somebody actually showed up there to look for the portal and say it's not there, now they're going to say that's because our prayer assault worked, if they even respond to it in the first place. Televangelists and faith healers do the exact same trick. They say, you have cancer, but I'm going to cure your cancer right now. So if you go to a doctor to have him inspect and see if you actually do have cancer, he won't find it because I'm healing you now. There are actually three places in your body that this thing is grown in. And it is cancer. But God's going to take them all out by the root. Everybody? There's three. Say, oh, Mario, this crazy talk, crazy talk. You have no idea how many times I've watched women like this go to their doctor and the x-rays show there's nothing there. This is the first you've heard of having cancer from me, and I'm healing it before you even have a chance to go to the doctor. They do the exact same thing. That's good. Now, there's one during the day that is harder to see. What, during the day? Since when is this during the day? This looks like a nighttime photo to me. What are you talking about during the day? I can see the stars in the sky. But yeah, but you can see it. It's, it's there. It's right there above the White House. You mean this lens flare in the middle? Anyway, the point is Roger Stone has never believed in God his entire life up to this moment right now. And suddenly he has a manipulation tactic and he believes in God just like that. Boom. How convenient for him, huh? So here's why I wanted to talk about him. He's been the subject of January 6th discussions. Like the January 6th hearings, we're talking about a lot of the stuff that he's been mentioning in recent months. This clip is from early April 2022. Now, I don't know if this specific clip was included in the January 6th hearings, but what he says here was included. They mentioned this. Listen to this. We have two parties in this country, the patriots and the traitors. This is black and white, good versus evil thinking, and it is a hallmark of a cult. You know that you're dealing with an extremist group when they view things in deep blacks and whites the way that Roger is encouraging people to view them. This is not about Republican and Democrat anymore. It is about those who believe in our constitutional freedoms and are ready to fight for them. And it is those who have sold us out, those who will buckle to the machine. This is a struggle between dark and light, between good and evil, between the godly and the godless, and we dare not fail or we step off into a thousand years of darkness. Now here's where it gets interesting. I actually recognize that from somewhere. Who said that? Somebody said that a while back, right? Yeah, 2012. None other than our very own Chuck Norris and his wife said something very similar about the Obama election. President Reagan went on to say that you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this last best hope for man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. Please stand with us. Let's unite for God and country, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. See you at the polls. Thank you. Chuck Norris, man. Chuck Norris and his wife. They are, they got some weird beliefs. We'll just leave it at that. They've got some very, very odd positions on some things. So Roger Stone has been saying, Roger Stone's been going on tour, basically, quoting people from the past who said absolutely unhinged stuff about a thousand years of darkness, stepping into a thousand years of darkness, and about a struggle between good and evil, dark and light, and all this stuff. And the January 6th hearings, they picked up on that. And they 
talked about the things that Roger Stone had been doing for Donald Trump, namely meeting with extremist groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters to plan out what their role would be on January 6th as they tried to take the Capitol. That's the kind of thing that Roger Stone has been doing over the past few months. That's what he was doing in the months leading up to January 6th, planning with insurrectionists. And that's why the January 6th hearings mentioned it. Well, he didn't like that very much. He got a little bit upset that people were calling him out for the nonsensical, terrible things that he's been saying. So he goes on Stu Peters, mid-July 2022, to complain about the fact that the January 6th hearings had clips of him saying that stuff. Listen to him harness the Christian persecution complex and use it to his benefit. I gave a speech on the night of the 5th. They played a bite of it. Absolutely love how he said it. They played a bite of it. I, I love it, dude. I love it. I gave a speech on the night of the 5th. They played a bite of it. Uh, and I, I express my apocalyptic view as a Christian that what the country faced was a fight between dark and light. This whole as a Christian thing, as I said, is brand new. In his entire 30-something year political career, never have I heard of this guy ever coming out as a Christian. Now that he sees that it's politically useful to him, he claims it. Between dark and light between good and evil, between the godly and the godless. They claim that that was the incitement to violence. No, that's anti-religious bigotry. I have every right to say that. The Constitution enshrines it. Nobody said you couldn't say that stuff. See, this is the thing. These people have the tendency to believe that freedom of speech means freedom from consequences, from social consequences. I don't think anybody ever said that him saying what he said, what we listened to him say a minute ago about a, a fight between the godless and the godly. I don't think anyone ever said that that was an actual direct incitement to violence. I think they said it was pouring fuel on the already massive flames on January 6th, which is absolutely correct. He's been saying this for a while. This is a battle between the godless and the godly. This is called stochastic terrorism. That's what this is. The idea that you can demonize somebody or something specific for long enough that you don't have to get your hands dirty. You don't have to step into the mud. You don't have to pull the knife out. Statistically, when you're speaking to an audience of 10,000, 100,000, a million, I don't know, however many, statistically, a few of those people will be mentally unhinged enough to pull the trigger for you. All you have to do is demonize people. Roger Stone knows exactly how stochastic terrorism works, and so does Donald Trump. They've both used it to their benefit over the years. Nobody's putting him in jail or charging him with a crime for saying this is a battle between the godly and the godless. Nobody is claiming that you're not allowed to say that. We're just pointing out what you're doing is stochastic terrorism, and he's throwing a fit over that. He doesn't like that characterization, I guess. Every right to say that. The Constitution enshrines it. But now, free speech of any kind is pointed to as seditious. It was seditious. And if what you said wasn't seditious, all the other things that you did on that day were seditious. This guy is a seditionist. And honestly, he has been since the Nixon era. This guy has never had an interest in serving the public good. Since day one, it is always about serving Roger Stone, first and foremost. The only reason he has ever worked for anybody else in his entire life, in my opinion, is to further his own goals. He goes up on this show, the Reawaken America Tour. I've talked about this a few times uh, over the past few months. It had Michael Flynn, Mike Pillow, a.k.a. Mike Lindell. It had Stella Emanuel. I mean, who else? It had a whole bunch of people on this this Reawaken America tour thing. Anyway, they got Roger Stone on Reawaken America, and he's continuing the tour of the Christian persecution complex that he's just picked up. Listen to this, mid-July 2022. For two years, I was vilified, attacked, smeared, threatened, gagged, uh, lynched, condemned to death because I refused 
to give in to the pressure to testify falsely against my friend of 42 years, Donald J. Trump. He believes that he was lynched by the January 6th committee for not testifying in the January 6th hearings? He doesn't actually believe this. I don't believe that for a second. This guy is only out for himself and always has been. That's who it's always been about with him. This guy has always harnessed anything that he possibly could, everything around him, and used it to his benefit. And now he's using Christianity to his benefit. He sees the usefulness of the Christian persecution complex, and he's going to use it until he can't use it anymore. Unfortunately, we seem to be entering a period right now where we're borderline turning into almost like a Christian nationalist state. There may not be a border with this Christian persecution complex. There may not be a limit with this. Like maybe he can use this as a bludgeon against other people. This is part of the right-wing playbook. Cry Christian persecution to get what you want. When you want supremacy, tell people you're being persecuted until you get what you want. Christians wanted the ability to lead their students in Christian prayer in the classroom. They wanted the ability to impose religious beliefs on students as Christians. So they cried that they were being persecuted because they weren't allowed to. We had equality before the Kennedy Supreme Court decision. We now have Christian supremacy after the decision because somebody cried persecution loud enough that they finally overturned it. That's exactly what Roger Stone is doing here, crying persecution until he gets what he wants. Dude hasn't been a Christian a day in his life, and now he's crying Christian persecution. It's disgusting. If you disagree with anything I had to say about this, let me know in the comments or on Twitter, at Telltale Atheist. They played a bite of it. A bite of it. What was that again? Let's hang on. They played a bite of it. Each on the night of the 5th, they played a bite of it. A bite of it. They played a bite of it. <laughs> Absolutely terrible, man. Absolutely terrible. There's nothing good about this guy's personality. He is awful. And he has been since the Nixon era. He has been since his involvement in Watergate. Doesn't Roger Stone have a Nixon tattoo on his back? Yep. Absolutely does. He has a tattoo of Richard Nixon on his back. And he's proud of it, too. He shows that thing off. Tattoo of Richard Nixon on the dude's back. No fucking joke. Like I said, he was extremely influential in the Watergate scandal in the Richard Nixon administration in general. So, yeah. He's proud of it, man. He's proud of it. He is proud of the underhanded, dirty stuff that he's been doing since day one. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and coffee cups and stuff on there. You can also check out my other channels. I have a Telltale Unfiltered YouTube channel where I go through long-form videos like Kent Hovind's seminar series, Jehovah's Witnesses TV show, and televangelists prophesying about politics. And finally, you can check out my social media. If you have a question for me, the best way to ask it is to tweet it at me. I'm on there all the time so check it out all links are in the description as always anyways that's all i've got for you thanks for listening